other things that owners do is they think about succession. They think about the long term for their for the company that they own. And they think big as individuals, who's gonna get this stock for me? Or they think who's gonna get this this company for me when I retire or die or whatever. I'll give you an example of how that plays out in practice. I've got sons in their 40s who are not farming uh, because the farm was not a viable farm. It was in a terrible climate full of stones and in a tax environment that would would curl a bald man's hair. It's just ridiculous and we just we packed it in and they went on and did other things and they've been quite successful at it. I've now got a five-year-old daughter who is showing right now a lot of aptitude for the farm and she's loving it. Okay. Well, there's too much of a management gap between me and that. Your management sweet spot, like I was saying, starts at about 40 and it probably starts to fade away at 70, 75, depending on who you are. You've got a 25, 30 year good sweet spot in there where you're skilled in managing. Well, by the time little Rosemarine would be old enough, okay, to start moving into that management sweet spot and be trained into managing and thinking like an owner, my wife and I are way past the time when we're the best ones to be doing that. So what have I done? I went out and pulled some contacts and worked and now for four years I've been working with a guy, he's 31 years old now, eight years in the Air Force as a mechanic on, on airplanes, sharp as all get out. And I have been teaching him everything I know about the technical management in the field, he wanted to farm, teaching him everything about the management in the field and now he's starting to move into the management of the operation. I'm having him make more decisions now about, well, you know, what kind of crop mix, what do you, how do you think we should sell this thing, you know, those kind of things. To fill in that gap, okay, so that there's somebody there, you know, we're an S corporation, so we can do that, he's now a, a shareholder. But to fill in that management gap, so that if Rosemarine eventually wants to take over the farm, she's there and she's got that management guidance. Or if he has kids, and he's single right now, but if he has kids, they want to move in, it doesn't matter. But the farm, the farm continues. The individual people are in some ways less important than the continuation of the farm. It's too hard. It takes too much effort and too much money to create a viable, pleasant, sustainable, organic farm to see it frittered away because of poor, poor planning at the CEO level or the <coughs> owner level, how do, you, how do you plan for succession? So this planning for succession is, is critical. You know, whether it's your children or finding somebody else or figuring out what are you gonna do? You know, if you're 65, if you're 70 years old, it's getting kind of late to start planning that. You could be drumsticks up tomorrow morning. And then what happens? You know, that it's, it's, you know, you could be at 33 as well. So this idea of thinking like an owner means not that we don't do our stuff in the field, okay, and that we don't enjoy it, but maybe we don't incur all those capital expenses for our nice little boy toys to make our time in the field fun and to have something that we show off to the guys down at the coffee shop. Is that a question back there? No. Is, is this actually beginning to, to make sense as a pattern now? Are you seeing ways that you could begin to think this way in your own operations? Which vice president position would you probably want to retake first? Well, where are the dumbest decisions most commonly being made? <coughs> Finance, marketing. I, I would contend. I would, con yeah, I would contend it's operations because that's where you're getting the clusters of foolish decisions and bad, bad capital allocations and malinvestments and so on. Primarily, okay. so that's the first place 
to begin to work on <coughs> more like a vice president. Like what, what is it, the actual operational side of that going to look like? Partly because it's the area with which you're most familiar. Finance and marketing are kind of scary for a lot of folks. Okay. Where's OCIA coming to this? Can we help farmers begin to think like vice presidents of operation with a, a bigger perspective than just I want it fun and easy when I'm out running around in the field. I think that that's one aspect. Uh, I won't say crop improvement, although I think there is a crop improvement function here, but it's certainly farm improvement, okay? Just that alone, if you get an $80,000 tractor out of the picture, that's a big help. I mean, if, if you finance, if, if you finance a uh, an item, let's say, well, let's just say a, a land purchase. Let's just say, because I can do the numbers in my head easier. Uh, let's say you finance a land purchase and it cost you two hundred thousand of borrowed money, financed for twenty years at six percent. That's going to cost you about twenty thousand dollars a year to service that debt. Okay. So it ends up costing you four hundred thousand for a two hundred thousand piece of property, and that difference is the, is feeding the bank. Well, I think you could maybe <coughs> use an extra twenty thousand, you know, ten thousand a year, whatever, to you know better than than feeding the banker. Begin to see how then you can look at renting ground or other things like that, wherever you can. But you have to, you know, and each operation is different. But that's where you have to. Start thinking differently than oh the neighbor's land's for sale. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab it. I'm gonna go down in the bank and borrow that, borrow that money. Or all the guys when when cross you know when prices were, were were up real well back in like 08. All the guys that went out and borrowed big, I mean huge big for all kinds of things. Bought land, bought bigger tractors. And, Oh, yeah, yeah. Bought bigger, you know. They borrowed big to get to get bigger because they made a mistake that's not unique <laughs> to farmers, mm -hmm. but they made a linear assumption. it's linear. It's not. It almost never is. So what happens then if you're borrowing based on those kinds of assumptions? Here's now we start getting to thinking like the BP finance. Uh, if you're borrowing based on this assumption and the ra reality of the market, <coughs> is that See a pinch point there? Because now all of a sudden you can borrow on that assumption and you've still got to feed that that debt. Hey Bart, um, I got a chance to buy a farm, 80 acres, and I want to uh, it irrigated, got a well on it, pivot, and uh, what's nine thousand dollars an acre? So that's seven hundred uh, seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Okay? I can borrow, I gotta borrow it all. So I'm going to borrow it from the bank, 4% in. How are you going to make that cash flow grow on anything legal? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> listen, Bart, okay. So the cash rent for irrigated ground in our area <coughs> is anywhere from four to $500 an acre. Okay. Okay, you get cash rent. Now you take 720,000 times four is right at 30,000, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so that's four hundred, little over four hundred dollars an acre. I'd rather pay four hundred dollars an acre interest instead of paying four hundred dollars cash rent because that's gone, 
and I'm putting it toward the farm, right? Maybe yes, maybe no. Do you have to own the land to farm it? Here, here's, the, here's the flip side, and I can't, I can't answer it for you, but we can, we can play tennis a little bit and bounce it back and forth, okay? okay? Um, what is it worth to you to have the freedom to get out on a year's notice if something changes, if, if you become disabled, if the market changes drastically, um, if, you know, if whatever happens? What, what's that freedom worth to you to have that flexibility as opposed to being locked in for 20 years? No, that's a seven year loan. Oh, it's a seven year loan, okay. Okay, so that's a pretty, that's a pretty steep. And this ground that I'm buying is organic. I don't have to transition. It's already organic. And what would you think about growing on it? Um, the guy that had it, had it before me had weed in there like two years ago. And Last year, soybeans have been performing. So, what, what do you get for yield? 180 to 200. On organic irrigated corn. Yeah. And what, what's current market price for? I can price? contract it for $9. Nine, yeah, it's going to be 10 if you were real lucky. Okay. Yeah, $9 is what I get. So, broadly speaking, $1,000 gross revenue per acre and probably netting out 250 somewhere in that neighborhood. No, be more than that. By the time you got all your seed expenses taken care of. Well, you're looking at, uh, like, say, uh, 200 bushels times nine is 800 dollars an acre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 200. 200. Where are you, where are you farming? Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay. So you got your own west there. You know, this is just stuff to think about, as opposed to I want this ground, and this is something that. Uh, if you know somebody that is a good accountant <coughs> or something like that, I would work with him and say, hey, help me puzzle through this issue. Here's the data. The one thing that I would caution is we've got to watch out for this phenomenon here. It's so <laughs> easy to assume that things are going to continue the way they are. That's the only thing I would um, question in your whole scenario. You're, you're right. And you're right too if you can set it up and, and run it and, and make that deal. Yeah. The only variable is the price of that land. Is it going to keep going up or is it at least going to stay well, stable? Well, the price of grain. Well, That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Because if, if, you, but, if, you, if, grain, if organic grain drops to five bucks a bushel and conventional is three, your, your model starts to get real shaky. And you see, you don't know whether that's going to happen. One of the things that we're seeing is a lot of downward mm -hmm. pressure. Like I'm saying, there's a bunch of places where the local elevator is starting to put a floor under the organic price. But they have possibility for that scenario too is put um, your best on your spreadsheet. Put your best number, your medium number, and your low. And if you can live with all three, then you might know your answer. If you can only live with the top. You might yeah, I'll, I'll show you how I'll show you how I do that. Because you can actually do these uh, sort of partial budget scenarios because <coughs> you know your cost for producing the stuff is going to be more or less more or less the same. You know, it depends upon if fuel goes back up. You know, depending on what track you've got, I mean, fuel's a, a big factor. But I do exactly what you because you got two two things here that are really going on. You've got, you've got yield, because it's your top line that's the key factor in all of this, <coughs> okay? Your, your, your bottom line is dependent upon your expenses, but the bottom line ends up being your expenses subtracted from your top line. And the challenge in agricultural forecasting is trying to figure out what the dickens that top line is going to be. And that is a function of your yield and your price. So if we have it here, this is exactly, you, you anticipated precisely what I was going to say. Your yield is going up this way. Let's just have low, medium, and high yields. And we're in, we're in the part of the world where yields are not entirely predictable. You got low, medium, and high yields just for the front of it. You have low, medium, and high price. Now let's just say, for fun, 
okay, then in your case, this yield is 200, this yield is 150, this yield is 100. I'm just, what, it, it could be something like that, you know, uh, different kind of weather years, different <coughs> especially in organic. And let's just say that your, your price range on corn is $10, $7, and $4. Your organic corn. So, if you just work this grid out, and you, you know roughly what your expenses per acre are going to be, okay, you know the cost of servicing the loan, you know the equipment, and, and so on. It's got to be reasonably cool stuff. That's going to fluctuate, but not nearly as much as this yield to price dynamic. So, what do you got down here? You got 400 bucks. Okay, 400 to 700. Thousand. You got uh, six hundred, ten fifty, and fifteen hundred. And here you got eight hundred, and fourteen hundred, and two thousand. I like that top one, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? Yeah, but, you know, the, the point here is that both yield and price are moving targets. Okay, now you've got, have you ever been in a situation where, you know, two people are trying to find each other and they're both moving? Well, the, the price isn't. I can lock that in. For all seven years? No, I'm not so. For this year. Yeah, yeah, what about next year? I mean, I, I've seen it. I mean, and, and produce is a little more volatile than, than grains, okay? But not necessarily. But my point is, is that you really, you're, you're, you're tying yourself into a seven-year commitment, okay, with at best one year of knowledge. That, to me, is at least a yellow flag. Because if you took a middle and a middle as, you know, your hurdle, You live with a, a thousand bucks, eleven hundred bucks an acre gross revenue, <clears throat> and make that model work. Because you can't really assume high yields all the time. Well, no. In, in a bean year, next year I go to beans, it's going to be low. Sure, I know. I'm, I'm just, know. I'm just trying to keep it yeah. a little bit simple yeah. here. But you can't assume a high yield every year. You can't assume high prices every year. Some years you're going to get high yield and high prices, and that's fun. Some years you're gonna get low yields and low prices, and that just plain sucks, okay? That's a technical term. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been there. You know, I mean, I know that routine. I know, I, I'll just give you one example. The best crop of oats I ever grew. Remember back the whole oat brand thing? And oats were going like $4, $5 a bushel, okay? And the summer I had oats in there, I got, <coughs> This beautiful crop of oats. It was 51 pound test, 85 bushels of high protein oats. I was growing them way up north. That was the summer the price for oats dropped to 40 cents a bushel. Mm -hmm. Okay, from 450 or so. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, I had cattle. I went out, spent 100 bucks on a used crimper that I could, could hook up on a pulley. And I crimped it all. I fed it through the cattle. And cattle prices were high enough that I ended up netting out about 12 bucks a bushel on my oats but only because I fed them through the cattle and because I had the flexibility in my operation to, to make that kind of an emergency response. But if I had been a, just a straight oat farmer, you know, or oats alternated with, with barley or you, you name it, okay, uh, and that had happened, I'd have had no options. And again, I'm not trying to give you an answer. I can't give you that answer. And I'm not sure you can even come up with that answer now. 